game that I helped develop at Maxis that uses pie menus to control the behavior of people living in a house. Whoa, debug assert. False calling a portal tree from within a portal. Please ignore. Um, anyway, this is the development version that has the Edith tool for editing the characters. And I'll show that in a minute. But first, when you click on some object, it pops up a pie menu that shows the options that you can do. So I've directed this character to get into the popped up. So if I click the right button on her, I'm controlling her, and now I can click on places. I can tell her to go over here, and she'll stop what she's doing, and go over here. So now I can click on the hot tub and tell her to go join and get into the hot tub. Oh, a neighbor just came over. So I'll click on the neighbor, and I'm presented with greet. So probably have to get out of the hot tub to do that, because, uh, oh, come on. Anyway, the point is that the pie menus pop up and give you a list of actions that can change dynamically. And pie menus are especially good when the items don't change all the time. But that's the design of this game, that um, when your social um, interaction with somebody changes, you might have different items on the menu. So I um, hope they just greeted each other. And uh, now, since they're, they just met each other, when I click on this new person, we can ask her to leave or we can compliment her. And that's going to develop a relationship with her. And as more um, as I get friendlier with somebody, I will be able to do more things. So, Bob over here, she's quite friendly with, so when you click on him, sit still, Bob, you get a menu full of different things to do, so, um, and this will change according to the mood, so, um, that's, uh, oh. little privacy here so I'm gonna kiss okay yeah let's okay that's pretty good so and ooh, oh now they are lovers so better not go kiss the other one in front of her now so uh, oh here's a neat little thing when somebody's walking uh, you can you can point at them and it slows them down so that you have a chance of catching them because otherwise they can run out of under your uh, cursor too fast. So in order to do social interactions, you need to be able to pop the menu up when somebody's walking pretty easily. So it's kind of like the tilt of a pinball machine. It, it gives the unlucky person you're pointing at a little less speed so that they stay under your cursor a little longer and you can pop up a menu on them. So, um, anyway, the um, editor for the game, when you go, um, the users have some editing tools for architecture and placing objects and changing the terrain, but there are more advanced tools that the developers use to add new objects to the game. So, um, these easy-to-use tools built into the game for players let you pick objects up and move them around and uh, throw them away and buy more objects. So, and then place place walls. And uh, this is the debug version of the game, so it runs a little slow. But I'm not allowed to place a wall in certain places. And then put a window in it. Wallpaper it. So these are these have to be really easy to use. So it has a, a kind of uh, chunkiness, a Lego-like grid to it, where things click into place. 
um, that makes it much easier for kids to use than a full freedom 3D graphics editor would be. So when you pick up an object, um, you can place it, and then while you're placing it, you can orient it by a pie menu-like gesture. Of, um, say I have a chair, and when I place it down, I press the button down. Now I'm holding a spin tool. You know, I'm, as I turn around, it'll spin it. So if I, I can pick it up and move it, and also when I place it, turn it. So this is really convenient. Um, for example, um, if I had a dining room table and I wanted to put some, um, here's the cheapy, if I want to put some cheap chairs around it. So I have to press down and move towards the table to orient the chair. And now the next chair is going to be oriented the same way. And now I'm going to press down and orient it again and put the next one down. And then press down, orient it again, and put the next one down. Press down, orient, and then the last chair. So it makes it easy to do this nice quick gestural style of, uh, let's see, you know, I could move them all. We're going to play um, musical chairs, so we might want all the chairs rearranged like that. Just drag in the direction you want it to face when you put it down. And then you can, uh, so here's a musical chair scenario. And just move the bush. So, um, you know, you can just press down on something and drag it like that to, to orient it. Oop, now the multi tile objects are a little unwieldy because they, uh, pivot around the tile, but um, it'll get red and tell you you can't place it there when it's in a bad place. So here's a neat thing where, see how it clicks into place when it's in a good place? But when it's in a bad place, it slides. So, you know, you, you, you don't have that nice stickiness, but when you get into a good place, it clicks right in there. So there's this feeling of slipperiness when you're between, and you can kind of tell just by moving that you're not in a valid location, but then you get this nice chunking. So that tends to make it just easier to use for people with low dexterity and, you know. <laughs> so, and you can also the game is able to download new objects and install them at runtime and plug them right in and they interact with all kinds of other objects that are already in the game and also users are able to create their own objects by cloning game objects that already exist and changing the graphics in the description with a program called transmogrifier and the additionally you can paint the skin of your character the characters are 3d um, skeletal um, character meshes that have a two-dimensional um, color image mapped onto them that's unwrapped that anybody with a 2D graphics editor in Photoshop or PaintShop Pro can easily paint. Um, it's harder to make a 3D character um, polygons, but you don't have to do that. Um, to simply paint uh, your face on the head or your clothes on the body. Um, the transmogrifier program allows you to export all the um, images of the object at the different angles and zooms um, as bitmap files that you can edit instead of editing it as a 3D object. Um, there are um, development tools for making um, 3D object sprites from then 3D Studio Max and rendering them out to Z-buffered sprites. Um, but the characters are authored with Character Studio on skeletons with deformable meshes and uh, uh, system based on Ken Perlin's um, layered animations that you can blend together. Um, now, the uh, characters are autonomous and just walk around and there's a higher level walking engine that follows a path. We can um, show paths. And, uh, well, anyway, it's not very interesting, but um, anyway, they walk down the path and go to the object the people know how to walk around. 
but they don't know how to use the objects. The objects know how to make the people use themselves. So when you download a new object, it has with it some character animation of how to manipulate it and interact with it. And um, it also has some programs that control the person's behavior and how it affects the environment and everything else. Now, the menus are generated from the advertisements that are in these objects that say, I can do this and I can do that, or you can do this with me and you can do that with me, but they depend on the mood and the personality type and they can be inhibited under certain conditions. So there's little pieces of code that get run that um, figure out what behaviors are appropriate for each person and object. And um, this is described by some people as uh, object, not object-oriented programming, but subject-oriented programming. Um, so people are objects. So when you click on another person, the items that you get in the menu depend on your mood and your relationship with that person. So um, if I don't know this person, so I can ask them to leave because they're a guest. And I can joke, talk, and call over because they're in a different room. So call over wouldn't be there if they were in the same room, and ask to leave wouldn't be there if they lived in the house. So um, basically there is um, there's a tool that the developers use called Edith, which is for Edith Bunker, the first character in the game, and uh, the Edit House acronym. Now it's it runs in a window and uses all these control panels here to um, edit the properties of everything in the game and browse things. So, for example, um, I could look at all the classes of all the objects that the game has loaded. Um, yeah, we just have all kinds of um, things. There are special objects for um, uh, character interaction and sort of invisible things. For example, you can download a um, guinea pig pet, but um, here's the come and see object when something exciting happens. It brings people over like when there's a baby. And the um, you can download this guinea pig object, and if you don't care for it, it'll make this secret hidden um, virus object that gives you a cold and has with it the animations and the sounds of coughing and going, <coughs> and every once in a while you just interrupt what you do and cough, and it will be bad for your health, and if you don't get enough sleep, you have to get sleep to get rid of it. This little program is literally a virus that runs and uh, lives in your household or in your characters, and your characters can spread them to the neighbors, and they'll bring them home to their families. So, um, anyway, there's quite a lot of interesting potential for what um, new plugin additions can do because of this programming language. Um, there's a built-in visual programming language called Semantics that is a, a control flow decision tree type of uh, language. So the come and see object, I'll look at that. And um, first of all, um, let's look at its tree table, which the menu is generated from. It has an advertisement. And um, the advertisement is come and see. And um, there are all kinds of parameters for each one of these ads, including the menu name on that you get when you click on it, um, and the attenuation, which is how close you have to be to be attracted to it, uh, autonomy threshold, which is just uh, whether people will decide to do it themselves or you have to force them to do it. Um, joining, you can. there's multi-person interactions like campfire or hot tub that you can join, um, and then have, get personal interaction in score uh, points that way, so to speak. Um, it was, it's available to visitors, available to children, adults, debug only, run immediately, allow consecutive, auto first select, things like that. But then there are the motives that affect how people react to this. So basically things advertise that it helps you with a certain motive and or any number of motives. And there can be false advertising, like dangling a carrot in front of a donkey. For example, the, the food chain is uh, implemented. It's a pretty amazing Rube Goldberg device. See, they're eating right now.
but what it took to get them to eat was a long series of interactions that goes one by one. So I'm going to tell her to go to the refrigerator and serve, or I'll tell him, yep, okay, he's going to go serve dinner, but he is currently eating, so, and talking, because um, that's a social activity that they do together, even though, so nobody's sitting, because, I don't know, they bad chairs. So first he has to put down what he has, and he's kind of sloppy, so he puts it on the floor. So he goes and executes in the refrigerator the serve food. Now he has his food. The food's telling him, I need a place to sit down. So he, this treat, this, this tabletop advertised that. Now, the thing is, he wasn't very good. He went straight to making a low quality um, canned food right out of the refrigerator. But if he had the, if he had the cooking skills and the, the appliances, they would be advertising that, hey, I'm a food processor. I can make your food better by using me. In a, uh, I'm a microwave. So, um, but they do it in a sequence called the food chain. And um, so I'm going to go and do a little shopping in appliances and get a food processor. Now, this is going to have bad feng shui. He's going to have to run around a whole lot to uh, do this, so it will be comical. Um, we'll put a, uh, another... This is the debug build, so it's really paranoid about the warnings. Um, we will just put another table outside to frustrate him. But the food pot, here's the refrigerator, and this will demonstrate the importance of laying your kitchen out carefully. Um, then after you do the food processor, you're going to need a sink or a countertop to chop it, and then the microwave, I'll cheat and just get some money. Um, and then eventually a trash can to throw the uh, refuse out in or a dishwasher or a sink to wash it in. So um, just ignore these. So now, ah, somebody put a serving plate on the floor. So he just went and picked up, it's going to be penalized for being on the floor. But basically, let me try to get him to do the food chain. And we're going to serve dinner. And I hope he doesn't just put it on the floor. So he puts down his food. And he goes over to the fridge. Oops. So he's taking something out of the fridge. He may not be very adept at this. Okay, so he's using the food processor there. That's good news. This may not taste so bad. Okay, he puts it in the microwave. Now, he's going to, once it's all done, he's going to need to place it somewhere to serve it. So these tables are advertising the service of being able to have things put on them, but unless they have something on them already. And then, okay, she's in the way. So... He's stunned. So that was bad feng shui there. That's that kind of amplifies the penalty of having bad feng shui the way they get stunned. So now they are all going to swarm over and now go to look for a place to sit down, which also involves interacting with the chairs. So if you find now a place to eat, if they don't find a place or are just stupid, then they might just stand eating. So the language has all these decision trees. So she found a spot. And she's going to put it down there and adjust the chair. So the chair was kind of called as a subroutine to route her over to the chair and then sit her down in it. And chairs, you can route behind them. You can route to their left, to their right, or in front of them. And then it has a different animation to get you into the chair from any of those. So you can have them crowded around the dinner table and still be able to get in. Or they can be, you know, they're, they're very complicated. And... Okay, now back in Edith, which is running at the same time as the game, as part of the game, with its tendrils deep within the game, um, we can look at the classes that of the objects, and if you double-click on a class, like, uh, let's find an interesting one, let's see... Uh, 
easel. So you double click on it and this is the browser for that class. So it's got categories of um, functions that are available from um, you know, like globally available or private available and um, we can filter how we see them but basically this easel comes with a bunch of functions to make it interact or make people able to use it so um, like here's a function called finished that figures out if you're done painting and um, what this is is a semantics diagram editor it's uh, the boxes and arrows language that uh, it's like a visual control flow um, it's very good for spaghetti code which um, is just perfect for what uh, is needed for so you can do comparisons and setting variables with these little boxes and double click on them to configure them um, and there's a whole bunch of different special primitives for taking one of those things and doing this thing with it um, to that thing and um, you know the game has this whole virtual machine you know this model of uh, what objects are that is very uh, unlike anything else I've ever seen but is designed to make it work the way it does so um, you have subroutines um, this is pretty standard um, you can double click on this private subroutine add points and bring up another editor and um, then there are um, there are functions for walking people over to an object and playing an animation and then doing all sorts of things um, you know from making um, sounds uh, we just would add a primitive when we needed to add a primitive to the language and uh, it's a pretty hard to support thing because it's just so idiosyncratic and close to the real implementation of the game so um, it's probably not gonna be it's not available yet for anyone else outside of Maxis to use but um, we hope that maybe a simplified version of it or tools what's even easier is tools that are geared towards solving specific problems that like making the painting or or um, you know making a certain type of game within a range that making a parameterized object that then we can make simple tools that that we can put new content into like a jukebox so but it's, it's really hard this would um, unfortunately break the game very easily if anybody made any mistake and there can be a lot of very subtle mistakes but uh, nevertheless it's really interesting to look at because it defines how every object behaves in the game and uh, who knows there's maybe all kinds of Easter eggs in here so uh, you have to just scroll over it and look at it or print it out on a giant piece of paper but um, basically um, the uh, there's all kinds of special editors for things that are in the game like of course there's one the module inspector shows all the running objects and um, so there's the bed, you know, is built, is broken up into all these separate tiles that do their different things. And, you know, there's some chairs and uh, the doors. There's a, evidently there's a flood somewhere in the house. And um, probably next to the shower, or, you know, some water thing. So there's a bunch of flowers. Uh, there's a help system. There's all these invisible objects that do their little things. The job finder. The mailbox is a very important object. The whole game breaks if you don't have a mailbox because it does a lot of scheduling and stuff like that. And the uh, non-player character controller. Oh, this was a very strange job. Uh, the Satan generator. Let's see what that is. Um, oh my. Um, this tree just wraps the idle primitive. So this is kind of the, the, the main loop of Satan Generator. And uh, let's see, where did that go? Maybe we weren't supposed to look at that. But <laughs> what that does is it waits until they're really, everybody in the family is depressed. And then it generates Satan. And if 
we look, we, I, we don't have a Satan alive right now, but the, um, let's see, let's see where he is here. We can take the class browser, go through all the classes, and look at what they are. Satan, NPC Satan. So here are the users, those are the people. And then it was NPC Satan Generator, an NPC Satan. So basically, if we look at the generator, its main function, um, oh my, um, maybe Satan does a lot more than we knew. Um, its main function sits around delay process and my attribute last hour process gets sims global hour so and the process is the interesting one here um we'll just climb up here so uh basically uh, it's it's setting this is actually more like a machine language than a high level language so it's setting these registers the kind of the pointer stack object um, set to next person to do a loop. I'm going to loop over all people. Now the stack objects, the way we don't type these in as sentences, we click things on a dialogue. So basically, the meaning of this dialogue here is that stack objects person data called family number is compared to the sim global current family. So we're just searching for a family that's current and looks at the relationship bad mood count gets bad mood count of stack objects to okay it's this is editing the relationship of the satan generator to a person in the family so use the relationship of the stack object to me get the relationship variable number of bad mood count into the stack local one call bad mood count. If the matrix is not large enough, then create it. So, basically, uh, we fill out these little forms and um, then make higher level functions out of them. And uh, now, the bad mood count, is that greater than 48? If it is, then bring the devil. That's a function. Otherwise, the stack object's mode of mood is that bigger than 60? Then the bad mood count gets zero if it is. Otherwise, the stack object's mode of mood is that less than eight, negative 80? Then we increment the bad mood count. So we're just modifying our tally of how long have they been in a bad mood until we bring Satan. So, and then bring the devil says set to next neighbor of type non player character Satan. Um, now, if there was one, see if that succeeded, then we go down here. Otherwise, we. Um, just return false or true. If it's conceded, the, we get the visitor schedule and we schedule a, a visit from Satan, which is this global subroutine that does all this stuff, basically. So that, like, kicks Satan off, and Satan's another object. And uh, character objects are pretty, uh, they got a lot of things that they can do. But uh, you can imagine. Um, if we look at Satan's functions, he's got whoop, um, do non-player character greeting, do repossess, get the generator, initialize traits, edit tree, load tree, main. So not, not too much, but it's probably, most of it's probably in main. So, you know, all these characters have a little program counter in these trees that is walking down over time, and so they're all kind of asynchronous and, um, you know, waiting for things to happen, like walk me over to this place and it returns true or false whether you got there. And then you can figure out something else to do. So this is the spaghetti code aspect of it, you know. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's needed to make it work. So, um, but there's certainly, um, you know, higher level approaches, but uh, this one was developed over a long period of time and has a lot of uh, inertia and baggage associated with it. And, you know, it took a lot of work to make all these tools. 
but it paid off in that um, we got the interactive editing ability and, and just prototyping and, you know, design sessions turn around and get it actually running really fast the next day and see what it's like, get it to the testers. So, uh, you know, you need a lot of tight feedback and be able to jump in and fix a bug because, boy, there were some really obscure bugs and still are. And, um, you know, it's got a debugger that will pop up. Something goes wrong and show you the trap, the stack, and let you browse where it, where it was doing what. So, um, you know, it's a big investment to make um, all these tools. But, um, you know, and if we did it again, we might approach it totally differently because <laughs> there's different tools available today. But um, it's a lot of fun programming in these languages. And... Uh, it's certain it's certainly um, we have had summer interns that came in and you know sat down with the programmers and they learned what you know how to approach this and were you know with some guidance but then they once they got it they struck out on their own and really did really amazing things the maid was written by a summer intern and did that was the first non-player character that really did anything and uh, it did quite a bit so um, the, uh, but then the testers found that the maid could easily, well, um, you could make the maid do kind of funny things, like you could build a swimming pool and put an island in the middle and then put something dirty on it, and she would jump into the pool and swim across and um, climb out and clean it without cracking a, a grin, you know. And um, But that got reported as a bug. But stuff like that, you just you can't expect, but you can't sweat because... Um, you know, <laughs> at least the game doesn't crash and maybe it will cause some amusement. So a lot of bugs or things that were flagged as bugs, just that's the physics of the thing. So, um, you know, you just have to say when, um, you're just going to stop fixing bugs and ship it. So anyway, um, let's see. The character animation system, um, was shipped before the game as a application called Sim Show that would draw the people in a window and let you paint the skins and see how they looked animated. So people were authoring um, character skins before the game was released. And um, I have a more advanced version of that now that I'll show. <laughs>